Reactive training systems. Hey everyone, welcome back to the RTS podcast. I'm Mike Tushir, and today I'm talking to Claire Zai. Now, Claire is most known as being an internationally competitive powerlifter and a powerlifting coach for Barbell Medicine. Uh, she is also a biomechanist, has a master's degree, uh, and will soon be a medical student. So, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how do you see these things being connected? Uh, we started to chat about this earlier, but I mean, I guess powerlifter and coach and even biomechanics are related in seemingly obvious ways, but uh, it, I guess is the common through line true for you? And then how does medical school fit into this picture? Absolutely. So first, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. I fell into powerlifting kind of out of happenstance and it ended up being a hobby at first and then became a profession. And the reason that I continue to want more education is one, because I'm a nerd, like we all are, but also the questions that my clients often ask me around how to handle life experiences that do not relate to the sets and reps of lifting weights are typically more medically related. And that's what really excites me about supporting people is lifting weights is really fun. It's really important for both a health perspective, but also there's this other step that it continues to impact that I feel I want to continue to support people in. And this doesn't always, uh, I find that I lack those skills as I'm trying to coach and I want to be able to provide a more all encompassing <coughs> health focused service to people as they go, as they learn how to power lift or just engage in healthy behaviors. That makes sense. Now, your athletic background was in soccer, is that correct? Correct. So I started I started playing soccer when I was four and played all the way up until I started college and then did not play in college. And then I was also a diver in high school as well. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. Kind of a mishmash. Yeah. But. So did you get into biomechanics uh, as part of like your interest in powerlifting and athletics? So I was actually interested in biomechanics before I was interested in powerlifting. So I've always been fascinated by the human body. I think mm -hmm. it's really cool. I knew going into college I wanted to do uh, physiology and biomechanics and neuroscience. So my master's degree ended up being in physiology. The emphasis was in this lab that studies biomechanics. And the thing that I liked most about, I picked the lab for one, the professor, and two, the topic that they studied which was the biomechanics of running, specifically with people who had amputations. And so I really enjoyed working with that population and kind of working within running, because that was something that I did a lot in soccer. Um, and it has just continued to morph over time into something that I'm more interested in personally and changed that way. So, That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. And I guess thinking about like your athletic interests now as well, um, you continue to have like a really diverse set of interests athletically yeah like you still run you uh you know when I come to the gym I hear you talking about doing different classes with yeah uh with people uh you were doing fencing I'm not sure if you're still doing fencing I was doing fencing for a little bit uh yeah. it was just for fun um yeah. I find I feel best just being active and trying new things I love to hike and so for me it's about creating a life that is uh, fulfilling and that includes a lot of different activities and powerlifting supports that a lot of the time and also I want those activities to support powerlifting yeah is that balance tough to strike sometimes I think the closer I get to yes it is tough to strike I have found that at the level I want to compete at being able to do all of these things is really challenging mm -hmm. there's just not enough time in the day to recover and, and there's just not enough time in the day to do them all. And so I really enjoy all of it, but I'm so careful about how I use my body 
that it can be challenging sometimes to say like, oh, I want to do these other things, but I need to save myself for this big meet coming up. Like, sure. I can't go snowboarding <laughs> if I have nationals in February. Like, that's yeah. not going to happen. Um, snowboarding is just too dangerous. Too many variables that I can't right. control. So I can relate to that. Um, I, I I was kind of always aware of some of those sacrifices I was making competitively. Uh, and the, lots of things that I chose not to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but it became more tangible uh, when I took a break from competing. And I remember thinking like, well, hey, I'm not competing right now. This is an opportunity for me to, you know, pick up some of these things I've been putting off. Mm-hmm. You know, so I signed up for uh, a kickboxing class and uh, went skydiving and things like that. Where, you know, always before I'd be like, uh, can you really afford a broken ankle at this time of year? You know, and things like that. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. 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 If you had to do it over again, would you still pull all those things knowing what you know now I guess so Uh, yes and no I mean like when I think back on like part one of my powerlifting career and then taking a break and coming back to it it was uh, it's a hard train to get off of but it's also a hard train to get back on Mm -hmm. Um, so you know it's easy to say like oh well I'll just take an off season and, you know, indulge in some of these other, other activities. Um, but like, where does that leave you? Like, what, what are you going to put on the back burner while you're, while you're doing this sort of thing? That's what, like, I really do admire the way that you manage it. Like, I think that's pretty cool. Um, it's definitely more balanced and like when you get to, I I don't know if this is necessarily the right frame to to look at these things through but as I uh, continue in this sport like I tend to think like when I get to the end of my career and I look back on it you know is that you know am I going to be happy with this decision or not mm-hmm. you know and, and I think having a, a well balanced lifestyle around it you know makes sense you know and, I think so too yeah. yeah I think it's so easy to burn out too yeah uh, especially given that like there's a lot of tension with picking a federation and uh, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of politics that go into that. That part is really stressful. That's a stressful part of powerlifting. I want the rest of powerlifting to be fun and exciting and support the life that I want to live and have a robust life out of it and not give up everything for just these yeah. opportunities. They are opportunities, but they're also like mixed up in a bunch of other context too yeah so it's not simply black and white well it's a somewhat narrow set of opportunities it's definitely not everything you know ross does a really good job of talking about this stuff he talked first of all it's really important to him one thing i hear him say in his coaching all the time is uh he wants to work primarily with the person and like treat them as a person first and the athlete second Mm -hmm. you know and maybe that involves like I know for him uh taking time each year to go snowboarding and like when he goes snowboarding it's pretty hardcore snowboarding yeah um taking time to to make sure that he's doing that is really important for his mental health and Mm -hmm. and I mean even that's a term that's kind of it gets banded around a lot but uh it's important for him to uh reduce his symptoms of burnout yeah Absolutely. Um, and especially like I mean for what you do and, and I and, and Ross like to do it athletically but then also to coach it and mm-hmm. it is a lot you know and there's lots of people who uh, are athletes and coaches at this point you know mm-hmm. so it's it, it is a lot and it would be easy to kind of take it too far so I think you know well it seems to me just from observing you uh, you know I've lived here for about a year and we've been training together now and then. Um, it, it seems like it comes and goes in cycles. Like as you get closer to a competition that the extra stuff, extra stuff, the non powerlifting stuff gets dialed down a little mm-hmm. bit. Uh, but then after a competition, it goes the other way. Powerlifting gets dialed down and the yeah. other stuff gets dialed up. 
Absolutely. I think about it in seasons, just mm-hmm. like I would with any of the other sports I've done. Um, you have a... And powerlifting is hard because um, you don't have a competition season the same way yeah. as you do in, like, soccer, where you're, like, working up to championships or something. Even though we are working towards nationals, you are involved in meets more often. Uh, I feel like, I don't know what your experience is, but I see most people doing two to three meets a year. That's what I've been doing. And that really is only four months between meets. And at least two or one to two of those months is like pretty intense training, which doesn't leave a lot of downtime. And so I still try and think about it as seasons of like, all right, I'm in national season, which is really important to me, (laughs) but like things where I'm doing things regionally or locally, I care less about. And I am willing to like not prep as hard for those meets. I still want to do well and excel, but the meets I really care about, that's where I'm going to put all my time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And then you can... You can modulate the amount of effort that you're putting into it, you know, Mm -hmm. depending on proximity to it. But I think... For a lot of years, anyway, like part of my experience was you would, yeah, it was more like three competitions a year. And for a lot of people, it was, you know, nationals and, you know, if you're lucky enough to go to Worlds and the Arnold. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of distributed out far enough that there was always something that was kind of close. And that's one thing that made kind of injury management difficult because you're always trying to get ready for something and Mm -hmm. you're never like really focused on just Mm -hmm. you know coping with one thing you know yeah yeah and I think when you start to add cutting in on top of that which for me has been like a big part of the last two years Mm -hmm. um and think and is now no longer I've decided that that is not worth the amount of effort but if you're having to cut if you want to live at the top of your weight class or above your weight class and you have to cut into it every time it's unrealistic that you're going to be able to live there, but also you have to cut three times a year, which is a lot of work and a ton of mental effort. Yeah. So. And it's easy to discount that, too. Yeah. I feel like you for also forget how hard it is <laughs> once you've finished it. You're like, I'm done. I did it. And then you're like, oh, man, I have to do it again in four months. But you've already forgotten how hard it was leading yeah. up to that point. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I'm fortunate to have not had to do too much of that but yeah I d- definitely do see it mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah well you and I talked uh gosh it's been a while ago now it was one of these training sessions where I came up and we were hanging out and chatting about things um we were talking about how people go about selecting a coach and I hear different heuristics about it I've you know shared some heuristics that you know, I think are good ideas. Uh, you had some things that you thought as well. Um, I suppose to kind of um, get us started here, um, my a lot of kind of what I've thought I borrowed from uh, from Dave Tate, who mm-hmm. has uh, if I I can't remember exactly what the rubric was that he would use to evaluate coaches, but it was kind of like these questions of where have you come from? Like, what's your education, formal and informal? Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, who have you been around? And then, like, what have you done? What's your track record in this this space? Which um, I've definitely misinterpreted in the past. Uh, It it has more to do with, uh, has this person, you know, worked with people like me? Do they have experience working with people like me? So if you're a beginner, that's beginner. If you're internationally competitive, do they work with other athletes who are internationally competitive? That, mm-hmm. that type of thing. Um, that always struck me as, as a reasonable um, sort of rubric. But I think when we were talking, the, if I remember correctly, the conversation started out uh, with some bad interviews that we've all had. Uh, where a client is obviously asking us interviewee type of questions, but they're just all the wrong questions, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, anyway, I, 
I remember that you had some really interesting perspectives to share on how to go about selecting a coach or things that were important to consider. Yeah, so some of the things that I want clients that I work with to ask or to know is kind of how often they want check-ins and how often they expect to talk to me versus how often um, realistically I talk to all my clients. And also, man, it's been a while since we had that conversation, so I'm trying to think of all the things that we talked about. But that was definitely one of them, of knowing the frequency at which you want to have contact with someone and kind of the contact that you're looking for, of like, all right, are you looking for support getting into the gym? Are you looking for support, like, just competing? Or are you looking for something else? Yeah. Um... And coaching is a unique relationship that I don't think a lot of people have had before um, when they're starting in powerlifting. Like, you've been in a team sport kind of condition, or you've been um, involved in sports like youth sports. And what's always so interesting to me is that, especially in the States, there's a big power dynamic in youth sports between the coach and the athlete, and that carries into adult sports in a really weird way, which I don't kind of prescribe or ascribe to of like I'm not in control the athletes in control um and I want people to be able to talk to me and ask me questions um but mostly the thing that I'm really adamant about people understanding and I have to talk to all of the people who are prospective clients and say like I want you to hear my voice I want you to hear my sarcasm and I want you to understand like how I talk and make sure that that jives with what you were kind of expecting from a coach because I'm not the kind of coach who's like oh we have to uh, really hit the grindstone and yeah. like um, I want to give people space to be human yeah. too and I think if that's not what people are looking for um, it's not going to be a good match Yeah. So. so years ago I was doing a seminar and uh, one of the attendees kind of noticed this shift in mm-hmm. in uh, coaching attitude uh if i remember correctly he saw it as being like a more like a broader shift you know that coaches today uh are just a bit different i mean you've you've got really broad experience in the coaching world you know and you see coaching in a lot of different sports so uh i would definitely defer to your to your knowledge there but um he was talking about the difference like how things have changed uh whereas before he was saying like when he was a kid you know the coach was the general on the field and you just did what the coach said uh where now coaching tends to be more of a collaborative relationship Mm -hmm. maybe that's just powerlifting uh or maybe that's just individual sports or i do think it's a better way to work Mm -hmm. you know it's it's a more honest way to work yeah you know like we know we don't have all the answers. Yeah. Right? So it's uh, it's better to collaborate with the athlete. I mean, for a ton of different reasons, too. Like, it's not just a better working relationship. I think it's a more effective one, too. I think so, too. Because the athlete is the expert on themselves. Yeah. And they know... I When I first started coaching, I recognized that I would just be like, here are all of my suggestions to how to, on how to solve a problem. And now... I'm more of the uh, opinion of, all right, let's ask a question. Let's figure out what the athlete's first step would be. Like, you know what you think would be the best step. Let's, one, use this as an opportunity to educate. And also, let me see where you're coming from on this and if we can find an even better way to, like, solve the problem that you're facing. You don't, like, having them solve the problem themselves helps me understand what they think the problem is, even if they're articulating it a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah, so. totally. Well, and they've, nobody's trained them longer than they've trained themselves. Mm-hmm. And they've been with themselves every step of the way, you know, and they'll have insight on that. Um, then there's the buy-in component, you know, but like I, I've got a, a client now who, notices lots of things he notices more stuff than I would notice Mm -hmm. just like looking at his videos which is great you know um 
and he's also, you know, I uh, kind of, I don't tease him too much, but now and then I'll, I'll give him a, a, a rib about, you know, frequency of communication or something like that, mm-hmm. because we do communicate a lot. Um, but it's that he's always thinking about this stuff, you know, and he's putting a lot of his own mental energy into it. And it seems really lame to write that off, you know, or, or to not utilize that to our benefit, Mm -hmm. you know, and some people, you know, if that's not, if that's not their way, that's not their style, they prefer to, you know, sit further back and Mm -hmm. want me to drive more Then I think that's all right. Um, that's not, if we were to sit down and say, okay, what is going to be the most effective? The only thing I care about is the result. Like what's going to be the most effective way? I think it would have to be, you know, the, uh, thoughtful communicator type, you know, I, I would, I think that's probably a more effective way to set up the relationship than, you know, the, uh, all right, coach, I'm disappearing for another month, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. talk to you at the end of the yeah, block. Yeah. yeah. I like the thoughtful communicator as, as the client. I think it requires a lot of ability to introspect, which mm-hmm. can be hard, but the thing I think some clients don't recognize is that, or some lifters don't recognize, is they think about their training for the three hours that they're training, well, hopefully it's not three hours, <laughs> hour and a half they're training four times a week, right? Hypothetically. And then they think about it when they get home, they think about it when they talk to their friends, they think about it when they send you their check-in. I think about it when they send me their check-in. Right. Like. The amount of time spent, and then I do that for 40 other athletes, right? And so I want all of that information organized a little bit. Um, and I, I want them, I want people who are prospective clients to realize I need your support, or I need you to facilitate me understanding what's going on in your training. Yeah. Which I think can be a very hard thing to communicate to people. Yeah. So. Well, <laughs> pardon me. There is, like, the communication aspect itself is super important. And, like, we touched on it earlier, like, communication style and frequency is important. But there's there's a, a kind of quality to it that I've found to be really hard to explain. And I've had a handful of clients that seem to get it and they send me their messages or whatever on how they think training is going. And I'm reading it thinking like, this is just like wall to wall gold, you Mm -hmm. know, and then other people, it's just not that way. And I struggle to find the difference and Mm -hmm. like, how do I guide people to, I haven't found out a brilliant way to do it yet. I haven't found a brilliant way to do it either. I think that, yeah. From my perspective, I'm always trying to inform clients of what I think is the most important without discounting their personal experience yeah. and how to kind of, yeah, guide them or push them in the direction of the things that I care about while also still answering all these questions that they find on the internet from <laughs> Joe Schmo and whatever he's come up with that he posted about yeah. um, that may or may not apply to them. And I say this all the time. What you find on the internet probably doesn't apply to you. It was written in the context of somebody else's problem. Um, yeah. And well, I say that as someone who shares a lot on the internet about yeah. how to power lift. Yeah. So. Well, it's um, it, it's to solve a specific problem. Lots of times these are ideas to try. I like to take it as idea fuel. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you got to stop and think, is this the time and place to try this idea, try idea you know yeah um we're three weeks out from competition it's probably <laughs> not you know um yeah. like i've got to got to change the way i bench press like well maybe later maybe you know? later right. i like to describe it as trying on hats mm-hmm. so i've always or i will use this analogy of you go to a store there's this person who is an expert at finding hats um and the client is the person trying to buy a hat and the coach is the person selling the hats And so you ask them for a tip or a hat and you try it on and you look in the mirror and you're like, I like this hat. And if you don't like the hat, you try a different hat. It's not like one hat fits everyone. Right. Or that the coach is always right about it. Yeah, they might. Most people like this hat, 
but that you may not like you may not like this hat yeah i've also started changing my kind of vernacular to be hey this is something that a lot of other clients have found helpful as a cue this is an alternate cue that might elicit the same change Mm -hmm. and that's often how i will try and give multiple options being like this works for a lot of people this is the outcome that I want from it, and here's another way to also get it. So, Do you find that a lot of your time spent coaching is is on that level, like a technical level, reviewing videos, talking about execution? Some of it. Um, it, depend, it drastically depends on the client and like what they're looking for. Um, for people competing internationally, less so. Like They know kind of what they're trying to do. But for... Um, People just starting out, absolutely. Uh, yeah. 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 You know, as we're talking about it, I'm still thinking about my problem of, like, how to get people to notice the things that I want them to notice in their training. And whatever I come up with here is no doubt going to be wrong or incomplete. But um, I, I'm thinking one thing that is common is that they're talking about their perceptions but they're talking about it in a pretty raw perceptual way not a really emotional perceptual way like they talk about maybe the squat felt heavy or their positioning felt off or the brace felt this or that Mm -hmm. not so much i was really nervous about the squat or or, you know Mm -hmm. yes i understand that you know sometimes the sets make us nervous and it's fine to acknowledge that but I can't do much with that. You know, we're Mm -hmm. just going to have to continue to face that. Yeah. Um, But in terms of like actionable information, it's the perceptual that tends to be a little bit more useful, I think. Mm Mm-hmm. Maybe. I will often have... This idea that I haven't vetted at all. (laughs) (laughs) I will often have clients take notes through the week so that by the time that they get to their check-in, if they choose to check in just once a week they have kind of had time to also then go back through those notes that they took and reflect on them and then write a check-in email, Mm -hmm. which seems to help kind of condense and organize everything a little bit better without making it... um, It removes the, like, emotional portion of the training that I was frustrated or um, I was nervous, which are valid things that I want to know about, but I also can't change immediately. And so I think it's good for people to, I will have people just like open an email on their phones and run a draft through the week and then edit and send it back to me afterwards. Well, there's a lot of that processing just doesn't, there doesn't need to be an action taken. It just needs to be processed, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so, you know, training went great and you're excited and want to share it. That's great. Um, or you're frustrated, that's fine too, that happens. You just need to process that and, you know, we can mm-hmm. move past it. You know, uh, it doesn't necessarily always need to lead to a, a tangible change to what we're doing. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And I think that also leads to a more autonomous client, which yeah. is something that I know both you and I want and... Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of select for in in clients yeah and even with people who so for beginners I recognize they will not be autonomous right Right. out of the gate like they need more support but by asking them to do that processing and reflection during the week you start to just kind of naturally create this more autonomous person who is willing to sit with those feelings and recognize how they can change them or impact training so uh, kind of on the area of autonomy and athlete autonomy do you think that communication frequency like how do you think communication frequency uh, impacts the development of that autonomy I think it depends when so I like to think about it as kind of like a a cycle like when you're just starting out especially if you're starting out in the gym or if you're starting with a new coach 
I think having a lot of frequency of communication or a high frequency of communication is important to make sure that you're doing things correctly and and determining kind of the the next steps in the training program. And that is not inhibiting autonomy. That's like just information gathering for sure. the client. Uh, but over time, I think that uh, I don't typically ask my clients to check in less. Um, I, I want them to check in as often as they want to, but naturally they will start to check in less because yeah. they feel more confident just tackling whatever they have. And we've talked through a lot of the scenarios that they might run into. Like, oh, I did this warm up wrong, now what? And then they adjust. Or, oh, I'm injured. What is the first step I take in the gym? W- one, not panic. And then you can take steps from there. And so as they become more um, integrated into the sport, they also are able to answer some of these questions more easily themselves. And their bullshit meter is a lot higher. Yeah. <laughs> they recognize when things are like... Oftentimes when I have a client just starting out, they send me all of this stuff that they find on the internet. They're like, what do you think about this? <laughs> I think it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, also dwindles. So There's a... I don't remember if it's a Saturday Night Live skit or, or what, but uh, anyway, the, hated it. Do you? I don't know. No, it. No, no. <laughs> like send, find something on the internet, send it to Claire. Hated it. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's an important part of it too. You know, just understanding what the processes are. I've noticed the same sort of trend toward you know, feeling more comfortable with, with a given process, you know, and that ebbs and flows too, you know, as you get closer to competition, there's more things to think about and more things to collaborate on. But, you know, if we're just kind of doing another training block, there's just not too much happening right now that there's not much to assess and evaluate right at the moment, mm-hmm. you know. So we're just doing the training, enjoying the process and, you know, we'll evaluate when it's time to evaluate but yeah that is one thing I I think online coaching has that's that's beneficial is it really encourages that sort of growth and autonomy Uh, at least from a training execution standpoint you still need I, I don't think there's a mechanism that's built in to cultivate autonomy beyond that you know but uh um, at least there's that, which mm-hmm. uh, is something that's not always present. Yeah, and we've talked uh, offline about how being available for your clients all the time does kind of take down that autonomy, and I think it's very good to have that option available when you need it. But, um, like, I have a 24-hour email turnaround, which is still a lot of work, Um But I think that for coaches, being able to protect your own time, especially for coaches who compete, it is really important to be able to protect your own time and also be there for clients. And there has to be a balance somewhere. You can't be there all the time. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, we've talked about this on the RTS team as well. I think for a lot of young coaches, it becomes a way to differentiate uh, you know, because if you're just getting into the business, what do you have that sets you apart from all these other people? Like, it, it's hard. So one thing that you can promise is, like, instant reply, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, that speed and, and frequency of contact becomes a way to differentiate yourself. But then as you grow in experience and you do this for longer, that becomes more and more difficult. And it's hard to be on call all the time you know there's a reason that professions that require people to be on call rotate that responsibility yeah. Yeah. you have to have some downtime to just take care of yourself mm-hmm. you know? yeah I think as a coach and as an athlete um, taking care of yourself outside of the gym is a big deal and we don't talk about it enough but it is important um, mm-hmm. yeah do you think that that combination like we don't see too many powerlifting coaches who 
well, I guess that's not entirely true. I was going to say we don't see too many powerlifting coaches who are not athletes, but there are quite a few who are not currently athletes. Mm -hmm. Do you think that being a coach and an athlete in in the same sport um, offers you any sort of additional insight that you wouldn't have otherwise? I think being an athlete in the sport that I coach in gives me insight into just how the sport works, which is very obvious. I'm not sure if being a coach in the same sport that I'm an athlete in matters as much. Um, Because I think being the athlete is actually the easiest part. It's just, and this is also a reflection of how I am as an athlete. I am definitely like a, turn me in the direction I need to be going and and just let me go. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And I don't know if that would change if I wasn't a coach. I don't think so. Do you? I... I think being a coach has made me a better athlete. I, when I think about the solutions that I've had to implement in the last year mm-hmm. to stay healthy, and there are things that I would not have come up with if I hadn't been a coach. And there, I, I'm not going to say nobody would have come up with it. it it's not that no one else could have thought these thoughts or anything, but I don't think it's commonplace. Mm-hmm. So being being able to observe my own situation and make changes has definitely been useful. Like I, I made a joke today that I was supposed to do, you know, an 85% double and I did four reps and I joked that after after the second rep I asked coach, if I should keep going, and he said yes, because I'm coach, ha, ha, I'm so funny. <laughs> you are yeah. funny. It was funny in the moment. Um, I, I think uh, what you're keying into and kind of what I agree with is uh, you develop a, an ability to view your training objectively mm-hmm. as a coach, and you can step into that role sometimes when you're the athlete. I think it is still very, very handy for me especially, I, I know I need this, to be able to offload that mental load onto someone else and say, like, yeah. hey, here's all these things going on. I need this objective viewpoint that you carry um, that I'm not able to tap into because yeah. I'm either too close to competition or um, I'm in too much pain or something like that where emotions are running too high that I can't step into that objective role. But when things are not as challenging, I am more capable of stepping into that objective role. Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. And I've definitely benefited from comparing or just kind of running my thought process by John, mm-hmm. you know, um, so I'm still writing the program, doing the whole self coach thing, but I'll just take it and run it by John. Just keep him in the loop because inevitably something comes up and then you do need that mm-hmm. outside perspective. And it's hard to give it when you don't have any context. So I keep the context or try to keep the context built. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, and it's useful just to have a second set of eyes to make sure I didn't forget something obvious or mess something up. But uh, then when you do need it, it's it's irreplaceable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And for a coach, I think knowing when to give that objective feedback and when to be more human is that's where the art of coaching starts to come in um uh, you have to read each client that you work with and figure out like when they need what and each one's different and so it's a challenge the interpersonal skills (laughs) Yeah. yeah i think i think well now too that you've competed internationally like do you feel like there were any major differences in NAPFs for like, other than it being upstairs <laughs> 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 on a second second floor right. um, sorry finish what you're asking well, me <laughs> I guess what I'm asking is um, so it's an international competition and it's a different level of competition 
did you gain any sort of insight as a participant at that level that you wouldn't have had, you know, that you could now, let's give you a hypothetical that you're coaching someone who's going to an APF next year, you have some additional insight that you wouldn't have had if you hadn't also done that competition. Yeah. Um, for me, it was a little different than local stuff because I could select whatever number I wanted for yeah. those three lists because I was attempting um, NAPF records on all of them. So that was like a new experience for me that I had not had before of just being like, what number do we want to take? We yeah. have any of them available to us. It's too many choices. But. It was too many choices. Um, I think the cool, I think for me, the biggest difference was partially traveling to the Cayman Islands was not that much further than mm -hmm. what I've had to do for uh, national level meets. Um, and I don't, I think the experience of meeting all those new people and seeing powerlifting in a context internationally was different, but the meet itself, the IPF is very consistent, mm -hmm. so the meet itself wasn't that different, Yeah, and I wasn't cutting, so it was way different um, in that yeah. respect, so. Well, culturally, it seemed, I mean, it's the Cayman Islands, Cayman right, Cayman so it's not, the US. it's not like you have to like get used to new food or mm -hmm. something like that although these days people tend to if you're doing a difficult weight cut people tend to travel with their food which is a smart tactic to mm -hmm. be honest but yeah it took us a long time to catch on to that <laughs> <laughs> as a group and then part of it i think maybe it was because uh with equipped lifting you were already taking a suitcase full of your gear uh so checking in another suitcase full of food just seemed like too much so yeah, that's fair. maybe that was it. Yeah. I'm surprised that you would check that because I don't let my lifting well, equipment out of out of my own hands. Like right. it the only time it leaves my hands is when it goes through the security belt and then it's yeah. right back in my hands again. So You would we would carry on all that we could, but like I know lots of lifters and this is complete overkill, unnecessary, but they would have a different set of knee wraps for every attempt of squats. You know, which is, why do we it, think that? Does it make a difference? I mean, I guess if you think it makes a difference, then, yeah, then it, it makes, it a, makes difference. a difference. But, <laughs> but like, are your knee wraps really stretched out uh, after one attempt? Almost certainly not, you know, not to any appreciable degree. Although, I guess now people change the kind of knee wraps that they have. They, or they, they may have multiple different bench shirts and... Like, I, I do mean that literally when people would show up with a suitcase full of equipment, you know, and it's not just squat suits and bench shirts, but it's your wrap roller and it's all your other stuff. And mm -hmm. you can get by if you, you lost your luggage, you can get by without most of it, but so you carry on what you could and then the rest of it goes in the bag. That's a lot. That's a lot of equipment. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's we have too much. a friend who's just starting equipped lifting at our mm -hmm. gym and it's wild to watch the progression um and all of the equipment that he needs for it i've yeah. never really been around that all that much so it's it's, it's so weird. much work it's a lot of work it's <laughs> different it's i think i think a lot of people get hung up on the you know what's real strength end of it and that's just not the way to think about it it's you a, know it's a skill yeah it's it's a it's a different thing. It's it's drag racing. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay, like, let's not get too hung up on, like, what's you and what's the equipment. It's it's the system together. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're interested in. And it's pretty intense, you know, especially lots of people are underwhelmed by their first exposure to it because it's not automatic at all. But once you kind of get your legs under you a little bit and you start to understand how to use the equipment yeah it's a really figuratively, funny yeah figuratively <laughs> and physically and, uh, yeah. yeah um it can it, there's a, a different kind of intensity to it and it's the most meathead type of workout that you can do in like i've done equipped workouts before where i'll do like three working sets of squats 
three working sets of bench and it'll take like three hours <laughs> to do all that <laughs> well yeah because yeah. it takes an hour to put on the suits and the yeah, shirts and to warm everything up and you take you do take long rest intervals and would be totally wrecked after that but not in the same way like you do a high volume regular training session which i don't know why this is i'm doing an equipped psa now but that's fine <laughs> um but you like said you, we would let it go where it went and yeah, it's this is where it this, went this is where it went <laughs> But if you do like a fairly high volume raw workout, like most of everybody's workouts, you are tired physically, Mm -hmm. right? But you do a very heavy equipped session and it's not the same kind of tired. It's more, it's not quite a mental tired, but it's, it has more in common with that, Mm -hmm. you know, like a brain foggy type of feeling tired, but not necessarily like physically drained. Yeah. But not mentally drained. That's not what you're describing. Yeah, it's not not like you took a test or something mentally drained. It's it, it's kind of hard to describe, but it is it's fatigued, but not the same kind of fatigue that you would be from a, a yeah. difficult workout otherwise. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's like the pressure, like the physical pressure mm-hmm. uh, that you're dealing with, or, or what it is exactly, but. Um, it's it's an interesting experience. I I do recommend people try it if you've got <laughs> access to it. It's it's worth a try. Some people like it, some people don't. Sounds really painful. It I mean there's that, <laughs> but you know, your belt's painful the first time you put it on and then you get used to it That's and fair. Yeah. it just be, kind of becomes background. Yeah. You know. Or like I worked with a guy years ago who he was new to any kind of physical training. Mhm. And it was really difficult for him to tell the difference between soreness and injury. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you start thinking, well, how do you tell the difference? And, but over time you, you know, just perceptually tell the difference and then you start to kind of like the soreness a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think equipped, like the equipped, uh, aches and pains are similar. Yeah, that makes sense. The values that we attach to it. No. Anyway, that's where I went from <laughs> athlete coach comparisons. But uh, <laughs> no, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. So, I guess going back to coaching a bit more. Um, what kinds of information do you tend to gather as a coach? Like, there's the performance performance information um you know you lifted x number x Mm -hmm. amount of weight for a certain number of reps and so on um is there other data that you think is important as a coach like sleep tracking and step counting and stuff like that for a power lifter for a power lifter um only from the perspective of health i'm that's more of what I'm looking at of like, okay, are we also participating in healthy behaviors that are going to set you up to do well in powerlifting? So are you sleeping enough? Um, how is your, uh, food intake? Um, is it high? Is it low? I just, I'm just still trialing like a new questionnaire with clients who are, um, more performance oriented asking about, um, very specifically like, what is your sleep like? What is your um, food intake like? Uh, but I added a, a question about um, what is your plan for the week? Um, and then also what skills do you have as a human that you're intending to apply to training this week? So based on the feedback that I've given you from last week, how are you implementing that? And what's, what like personal skills are you using to like be better in training this week as trying to focus on getting them to be more not only process oriented but um a little more proactive of like all right this is something that i'm really good at um and this is how i'm going to apply it to training because i found that it's very easy for people to be critical of themselves especially because this is such a number-based sport and i'm trying to pull on other levers that are um, what else are you good at? Kind of an idea. What yeah. else are you good at and how can we how can we capitalize on your unique 
specific things in training that make you good. I really like so, that idea, by the way. Yeah. Do you have an example on, like, how that might look? Of, like, how someone would respond to that? Yeah. Yeah, so I have a client who I'm currently kind of trialing this with and trying to work out kinks and wording and stuff. Um, but one of the challenges he's been facing is every week he is traveling. And so he's like, my skill this week is um, reaching out to friends and people around me to make sure that I make time to go to the gym and that it's with people so I can like double up this socialization and training thing. Um, so for him, that's like a very unique kind of yeah. skill that he's working on. Um, but I imagine it kind of coming up as like a, uh, or how I would like it to appear is um, a client saying, oh, I'm really good at uh, self-assessment. So this is how I'm going to apply self-assessment in training this week. Um, or uh, I'm really good at uh, making friends with people and I'm going to maximize this skill that I have um, to make training feel more fulfilling for me. Um, and my goal is to really try and cut some burnout for people who rec like we have long periods of time where we don't PR, so we need to have something yeah. else that we're working towards. And I find that, um, just improve, like there is only so much you can do to improve form over, over a oh, period yeah. of time. You're just like, all right, this is what it is. And this is how I have to continue to train it. Yeah. Um, and I find that trying to improve the, the human and incorporate that into training is, I'm hoping, going to be more impactful than helping them feel fulfilled by a training day that is just a run-of-the-mill training day. Yeah. So. I, I really like that idea, you know, and, and the idea of, like, leveraging, you know, these other aspects, these other strengths that you have. And, and I mean, you would do that with any other goal that you had you know if you you know started a new business you would not just use one set of skills you would use all of the skills that you could bring yeah exactly. yeah it's a good idea have you you said you're just trialing it so maybe not but i could foresee possibly somebody coming back with like a, i don't have any other skills you know that's home. actually happened already, yeah. uh, and that's why I'm, like, trying to work out the kinks of, like, uh, athletes at the at the level that I think we work with them at are, they have to be critical of themselves because that's how you create change, mm -hmm. um, and that has turned, and it's a good signal for me to be like, all right, this is a conversation I need to have about we can be critical, but it also has to result in, in changes. We can't just continue to tear ourselves down yeah. as athletes. Um, so let's find some, let's find things that you're good at, um, that are not, um, related to powerlifting yeah. as closely. And I think it also encourages people to recognize that there are a bunch of other things in your life that you can pull in to this. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I like to focus on or, or bring attention to the wins that we find in training. It, it's interesting. I was doing this. Sometimes you have to dig deeper than others, and that's telling. <laughs> I mean, that's telling as well on yeah. like how things are going. And nobody's fooled by that. Nobody no. thinks that you know. Oh, that means you know. Well, you had a, your warm ups went great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody nobody's confusing that for like yeah. actual grid news on big progress um i don't know it's interesting i had an athlete who i said almost that same thing to recently and uh, <laughs> she was her response was something like uh, you know i mean that's nice that you know warm-ups went great but you know are we uh are we just finding the positive to find the positive here and i said maybe <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'd be willing to to do that like I, I still think it's worth doing you know it, sometimes that's it's better to find the positives that are there than to just let them go unnoticed yeah um, and it gives you something to build on you know and, um, which 
I, I think I think we all so uh, another issue that to me anyway is related to this uh, I noticed a, a while ago that we would have clients that um, it's it's it, it's not a humble brag it, there's this particular kind of post that people would make like uh, like half complaining about training you know oh can you believe coach has me doing split squats for 12 again you know like it's a and i eventually noticed it as being like oh you're in a way kind of bragging about the difficulty of your training but doing it in a way that's socially acceptable Mm -hmm. you know so i thought could we just give you a way to do that in a positive way that's socially acceptable Mm -hmm. so i started trying to intentionally cultivate that like and so talk about um what went well in training this week? Like, what did you do? What were your successes? Uh, what did you learn? Um, and hope, you know, people, mm-hmm. oh, I got a PR in this. I did a, you know, you know, did my Bulgarian split squats this week for 12. And mm-hmm. it was really difficult. Like, just kind of giving people an outlet for yeah, it. Yeah. And, but do it in a way that's a little more positive than, <laughs> you know, complaining about yeah. coach being out to get me. I mean, I complain about my coach being out to get me all the mm-hmm. time, but he's where. So, <laughs> um, oh shoot, I had something to add to that. Never mind. Guess it wasn't important. No. It was gone. I'm kind of all over the place anyway. That's funny. Um, oh, I know what it was. Yeah. Um, I find that there is a small subset of individuals who um, are very number focused, which is totally fine. Um, but if their only focus is numbers, it can be very easy for them to spiral into like, uh, this is never going to work. Like everyone is surpassing me. And, um, when I recognize that client, I work extra hard to find those positives. Um, (laughs) even if I do have to dig for them, um, because I want to be able to counteract that and come up with like, yeah, uh, numbers aren't changing, but here's a good thing that's happening and how can we shift this good thing that's happening and turn it into um, kind of like fuel to actually get those numbers to rise. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I find this comes up a lot of times between like long-term and short-term numbers, you know, that something has happened, you know, lifts regress just like they do sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we're in a period of rebuilding. Um, so this week was, you know, slightly better than last week, and we're starting to build on this trend, but we're not at PR levels. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of this focus on, yeah, but I didn't send a new PR today. Like, mm-hmm. Well, we knew that. We knew that this was likely not going to happen coming into the session, but we're never going to get there unless we go through this period first. And mm-hmm. you've got to, you built on what you did before, and that's worth feeling mm-hmm. good about because what else can you do you know you can feel bad about a session that is leading you in the right direction but that seems wrong yeah yeah, yeah. do you set expectations for clients of like hey uh we are in a period of rebuilding i do not expect Ooh. greatness right now do you do that i don't yeah but maybe maybe that would be worth doing I'm, I'm not suggesting it. I yeah. was curious if that is an expectation that you set. Sometimes with injuries, I will. Yeah. I'll be like, I do not expect you to be at full strength levels for a little bit. And we are operating under that paradigm. Because yeah. otherwise I find that they're like, why am I not better yet? I'm like, because I'm actively holding you back with the programming. Um, like, I'm actively keeping you at a tempo or... Uh, right. Right trying to give you things that are so different that you can't compare uh, and therefore you yeah. feel like you're being held back because you are. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, but that's part of the part of the recipe. Yeah. I don't know. I, I guess as I think about it, and I, I still relate a lot of things to my own training, I would be reluctant to do that myself because sometimes I... I'm surprised, you know, Mm -hmm. sometimes you would, you know, you think like, oh, this is a period of rebuilding and then, you know, 
surprise. Yeah. <laughs> You're it, extra strong today. Yeah. It, yeah. Re- it still maybe it might still be rebuilding, but it's rebuilding faster than you might have mm-hmm. otherwise expected, mm-hmm. or something like that. And, yeah. And it, that can lead to to good places, and you do see that happen now and then. It's just that you also see it not happen as well, mm-hmm. and it's not something you should expect. Yeah. Know. Yeah. I like to set the expectation of, it might be a while, I'm not going to give you a time frame, but if it goes faster than that, great. Right. But um, I've had some clients that are frustrated with the pace at which they're getting better, Mm -hmm. which is very understandable, um, and myself included, like, frustrated that it's not getting better faster, um, but also being able to recognize that, like... Um, this pace is very normal. Yeah. And that is, I think, helpful for some people because they don't feel like something's wrong. Um, Time distortion is a weird thing, though, right? Like, take a a month, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to take you a month to get over this, you know, or whatever. And on the front end, looking at a month into the future feels like a long period of time. But then you get on the other end and you're looking back and it doesn't seem like so long anymore. It's it's weird how that works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So but there's goes. just so much fear wrapped up in injury that I try and curb some of that as much yeah. as possible. So. Yeah. It, I mean, I definitely get that. Still have some of it uh, around certain injuries. But then a lot of it, the more you get exposed to it, you're like, yeah, it hurts. It'll hurt for a while and then... It'll probably get better. Yeah. You know, I guess that's true until it's not true. (laughs) (laughs) As someone who's, I'm asking you, as Mm -hmm. someone who's been injured multiple times, do you feel that the the fear of re-injury has reduced over time because you're more confident in uh, being able to handle the injury or just because you're like, yep, this happens and it'll go away? I think having the confidence in how to handle it is a lot of it Mm -hmm. for me. I mean, I've tweaked enough things now that if I tweak something, I know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know a lot of it's the the unknown, you know, so having an idea of what the time course would be is really helpful to reducing all that anxiety that you feel. Um, but then there's a whole slew of injuries that I haven't had and don't have any experience with that I don't have any of the mm-hmm. skill built up around, you yeah. know? So I still have, uh, a, I guess you might say a more typical reaction around any of those types mm-hmm. of injuries. Yeah. It's, I assume that most injuries will react similarly yeah. unless it's like trauma. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like those I, those I have no expectations for. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I suppose to kind of wrap up uh, wrap up our interview here, um, if we go back to Claire, the athlete, we have talked uh, a bit and you've talked a bit about kind of uh, what's going on and, and how life has been a lot of chaos after NAPF. Yeah. And that the next powerlifting thing on your radar is uh, PA Nationals in March, I believe. I think so. Right? (laughs) I think think it's in March. (laughs) I think it's March. We'll get the month right sooner or later before before it happens. Before March, we'll figure it out. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I'll be there. Yeah. yeah. Someone will put me on a plane. Right. We'll sort that part of it out. But what is this period of training like? What are some of your focuses? Mm. Like, how do you... How do you think about your own training at the moment? Yeah, so uh, like you said, life is kind of RPE 8 to 9, a little higher than I would (laughs) like it. Um, But training is absolutely on the back burner right now. My goal for training currently is to make it to the gym four times a week. Mm -hmm. And I think as, uh, as an athlete and as a coach, it is hard to admit that that is like a struggle that I'm having that motivation in training is challenging and I want to normalize the fact that you're allowed to have even if this is your profession it's it's okay that 
it's kind of hard sometimes. Um, <laughs> that's my neighbor's dog, Albert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's, it's challenging, um, but my goal is to get into the gym, achieve the stimulus that I want, and build momentum to enjoying training again. I just don't find, I find joy being in the gym, uh, but I find getting to the gym very, very challenging. And so for me, looking forward <laughs> to NA or PA Nationals, my goal is to um, fit powerlifting back into my life in a way that it adds to my life. Um, and that means uh, I contacted my own coach and was like, hey, training needs to be more fun than it is right now. Uh, there are some things that are holding me back from finishing training. Can we make changes? And it's required me to be a little bit more proactive in my own training, where typically after a meet, I'd be like, this is coach's job. Like, right. I'll just do what I'm told. Um, and wouldn't check in, but uh, just leaning on coach more right now, and that's okay. And... Um, yeah. 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 It's just it's just a different season for me and sure. very thankful that I don't have to cut anymore. Um yeah. all of those things just trying to make powerlifting as accessible for myself as I possibly can. Yeah. So well, look, fun and training is underrated. Severely <laughs> underrated. Yeah. You know, so and it, it's different for everybody too because lots of people as a coach you hear fun and training and Lots of people mean they want it to be more like pump work, but then some people hate that. Yeah. So it's definitely an individual kind of thing to, so some people like for me, I like novel movements or mm -hmm. playing with weird machines or something like yeah. that. Some people apparently hate that and I have a really hard time imagining <laughs> why. <laughs> um, I hear fun in training and... I hear two things. I hear uh, socializing with the people around you. Yeah. Um, but also I hear, and this is from a coaching perspective, when I hear fun and training, I'm like, all right, so you want to be PRing every week. Got it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I know is not what they mean. Um, but I also recognize that when you are PRing every week, it is really fun and you are excited. Yeah. Um, and so just uh, being able to back off my training RPE to adjust for life RPE being kind of hard. Well, I mean, that's, totally fine. that's really smart. It's, uh, it's the smart long-term play. And that's the one that eventually is going to win anyway. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, Claire, thanks very much for thanks sitting for down having and having me. this interview with me. Yeah. Um, it's always a, a joy to uh, talk with you about training-related stuff. So... On social media, uh, where I see you most often is on Instagram. Is that? That is correct. It's okay. Claire at, no, Claire underscore Barbell Medicine. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks again. And thanks everyone for listening. And we'll see you next time.